Hi, welcome back to Movies Reloaded. Today we have a great recapped movie for you. So sit back and relax and enjoy the film. Carol, a character in the film, sets out for a walk in the streets when she notices something very strange. There isn't a trace of emotion on anyone's face, suggesting that people have become soulless. The area has become a ghost town. The situation is made worse by the police arresting those who display emotions. Even an elderly woman who keeps repeating, don't sleep, is apprehended by the police. A normal-looking cop comes up to Carol after a while of walking and notices that she is perspiring. He therefore warns her to flee lest she be apprehended and put to death. It seems that sleeping or expressing emotions will result in death. After that, the scene is cut to a few days prior. A space shuttle detonates on the planet's surface, dispersing across numerous U.S. states. Every media outlet in the nation is reporting the news because they think it is an indication of an alien invasion. In contrast, the people are frightened and reluctant to touch the debris out of concern that it may be contaminated. Tucker Kaufman, the director of the Centers for Disease Control, arrives at one of the crash sites in the interim to conduct an inspection. He approaches the research group and learns that the piece of debris contained a mysterious organism with extraordinary radiation resistance. The organism's capacity for rapid multiplication suggests that it may have originated from another planet. Later, as Tucker is getting ready to leave, he unintentionally touches a small piece of trash and cuts his finger. He doesn't give it much thought, though, and moves in the direction of his house. That evening, Tucker begins to experience intense cellular condensation on his face and excessive sweating, as if something has taken control of him. The next scene introduces us to Carol, Tucker's ex-wife. She resides with her husband and their only child, Oliver, and works as a psychiatrist. Oliver has a nightmare that night and begins to scream, but his mother intervenes right away to calm him down. Carol receives a call the following morning from Tucker, who requests to see his son. She simply hangs up the phone after saying no, as was to be expected. She drops Oliver off at school shortly after that and then heads to work. She meets up with Dr. Ben Riskel, her best friend, while traveling and gets a ride. Due to the resignation of every researcher on the crash site, Driscoll claims that the government is keeping something significant from them. Carol, however, isn't in the mood to talk about the subject and instead vents about her ex-husband. She informs Driscoll that despite having been gone for the previous four years, Tucker has been acting very strangely lately and has suddenly expressed a desire to see their son. The two friends are still talking when they reach Carol's office and part ways. Carol begins the day's counseling session later. Wendy, a middle-aged patient of hers, tells her that her husband has recently been acting very strangely. He killed their family dog a few days ago without showing any remorse. Carol recognizes that something is wrong right away, but for the time being, she only gives her patient a few prescription drugs. It being Halloween night, Carol and her neighbor Pam take their kids out trick or treating after work. The family dog starts barking a lot when they get close to a house, like it has heard something. As Carol and her group are about to leave, Andy, Pam's son, is tackled to the ground by the dog, who had just lunged at him. Surprisingly, the young boy doesn't even quiver in the face of the terrifying situation. Instead, he uses his bare hands to squeeze the dog's mouth until assistance arrives and separates the two. The mothers chat briefly when they arrive at Carol's house after the group has left. Pam admits that Andy has been acting very oddly for a few days, and occasionally she wonders if he has forgotten his emotions. Being a psychiatrist, Carol reassures her that it is completely normal for children his age. When Carol enters the room where Oliver was screaming from, she discovers a strange piece of flesh protruding from his hand. She quickly brings it to Driscoll's lab, where his friend and well-known scientist, Dr. Galino, begins his experiments out of concern. A mysterious virus has started to ravage the nation in the interim. Every day, thousands of people pass away, but no one can pinpoint the cause. As a result, an urgent gathering is held in the nation's capital with participation from all the top scientists. The meeting's keynote speaker, Tucker Kaufman, explains that the new virus is spreading at an unprecedented rate and that the nation will enter recession if nothing is done about it. Tucker responds that implementing an immunocetian program is the only way to stop the spread when some researchers inquire about the solution. As the meeting continues, several sick waiters can be seen throwing up into the tea that will be served to everyone in the kitchen. Later that evening, Carol makes the difficult decision to let Tucker spend the weekend with Oliver because, after all, he is the father. A woman who is frightened walks up to her as she is driving to his house and asks for assistance. She repeatedly warns that a terrible thing is about to happen, but before she can explain why, a car runs her over. The police show up on the scene shortly after that. The head cop simply tells Carol to go home despite Carol's claims that she is prepared to testify against the negligent driver. 
Carol begins to believe that something very bad is happening in the city after hearing this. After some time, she leaves after dropping Oliver off at Tucker's house. The same evening, Driscoll and Carol attend an opulent party where they briefly converse with Dr. Belisic and his wife Ludmilla, a diplomat from the Czech Republic. After meeting other diplomats, including Dr. Yurish, the two discuss the negative aspects of human nature. Driscoll tries to kiss Carol in the car after the party, but the latter pulls away because she doesn't want to end their friendship. On her way to work the following morning, Carol notices something very odd. A few people have completely frozen, as though their souls have been snatched away. She is shocked to discover that every one of her clients has cancelled their appointments for the day when she arrives at the office. She gets a call from Driscoll at that precise moment informing her that the strange skin patch test results have been released. In the following scene, Carol enters the lab and finds Dr. Galino there to greet her. He reveals that the skin sample contains a number of molecular spores that invade people's brains while they are sleeping and change their genetic makeup, making them unstable. They are therefore prohibited from sleeping until a cure is found in order to stop the fatal infection. Driscoll receives a call from Lidmilla informing him that Dr. Yurish has been acting oddly. The three dash to the diplomat's home as a result, where they discover Yurish in a terrible condition. When Carol tries to photograph him, the man who resembles a monster jolts to life and attacks her. However, before any significant harm is done, Driscoll diverts Yurish, causing him to hurl an odd liquid and pass away. After the incident, Carol panics and rushes to get Oliver back from her ex-husband. When she arrives, she finds Tucker and a few of his colleagues in a meeting. Tucker reassures Carol that Oliver is playing at his friend Jean's house despite Carol's concerns for her son. She still isn't persuaded despite this and begins to look for her son. But just then, the men from the meeting encircle her. Carol, who is terrified, tries to flee, but Tucker easily tackles her to the ground and spits on her. Fortunately, she finds a way to leave the house and enter her vehicle. Carol causes an accident in the neighborhood by driving carelessly. She is once more being pursued by a group of infected individuals when she exits her car. She manages to get away from them, even this time, and enters a subway station. Soon after, Carol boards the train, which is packed with people who all have blank looks on their faces. She receives a message from Oliver at that precise moment asking her to save him right away because Tucker has taken him somewhere. Carol is concerned about this, and when she sobs in desperation, a fellow passenger advises her to maintain her composure so as not to be seen. A group of infected travelers bursts into the compartment and begins fighting. Carol evades their attempts to control her and escapes from the train. When she returns to the road, she sees some police officers compel an infected people to receive the virus vaccination. An unaffected police officer tells her to flee while observing the sweat on her face, demonstrating that the infected ones are unable to perspire. At this point, the city has devolved into a battleground and a number of individuals are doing the unthinkable in order to protect themselves from the virus. Carol Rush is over to the Belisic mansion in the following scene, where Driscoll and Dr. Galino are still conducting their tests. After some deliberation, Driscoll decides to assist Carol in her search for her son, and Dr. Galino and his assistant get ready to leave for Fort Detrick, Maryland, in search of a virus cure. They also make the decision to remain awake out of concern that they may have become ill. When Carol and Driscoll return to the streets later, they see Wendy being taken away by the police with force. The infected officers zap her with a stick and knock her out when she tries to fight them off. She doesn't turn, despite this. This is noticed by Carol and Driscoll, who surmise that Wendy has somehow developed a virus immunity. After some time, the pair snatches a police vehicle and drives to Carol's workplace, where they start looking through Wendy's medical records. Driscoll learns that Wendy had encephalitis, a condition that affects the brain, which is why the virus is reluctant to infect her. Only healthy brains are typically targeted by the virus, allowing it to feast on them and grow in number. Oliver sends Carol a text message at precisely that moment informing her that he is being held at his grandmother's house in Baltimore. Carol confesses to Driscoll that she has already contracted the virus out of fear. Her best friend reassures her that everything will be fine despite this. Then, before the city is sealed, Driscoll manages to deliver Carol to the train station. The two exchange an emotional farewell before leaving. Then Carol gets on the train to Baltimore, where she unintentionally meets Oliver's friend Jean, who has also contracted the disease. It transpires that he is going to meet Oliver as well. Tucker shows up at the station when the train reaches Baltimore to accompany Carol and Jean to his mother's house. Tucker leaves the house after receiving a call from his friends that evening. Carol searches the house for her son at this ideal moment and eventually does. After an emotional reunion, Oliver reveals that despite sleeping every day, he has remained uninfected. 
Here, we learn that the young boy regularly takes medications for his sleeping disorder, which accounts for why he isn't exposed to the virus. Gene approaches the two suddenly and tries to spread the virus to them, but Carol easily brushes him off and runs out with her son. Tucker learns of the escape while leaving and immediately pursues his family. He follows them into a shuttered warehouse and makes an attempt to harm them, but Carol grabs an iron rod and strikes him in the head, killing him at last. The mother and son then walk into a pharmacy, where Carol finds an injection and gives it to her son. Then, in case she nods off, she tells the boy to inject it into her. Driscoll calls her in the interim, and she tells him where they are. Oliver moves slowly toward a door that has blood splattered near it as she is focused on the call. He is immediately stopped, and she enters to inspect herself. She rushes out of the area after seeing several infected people lying on the ground there, but not before stealing a gun from one of them. Later, when Oliver starts to sleep, Carol scrambles to find anything and everything she can get her hands on, including medications, to keep her awake. The following morning, the infected individuals in the room have reanimated and are repeatedly knocking on the door to leave. This causes Oliver to awaken, and when he notices that his mother has dozed off, he quickly gives her an injection, thus saving her life. But the threat has not yet been eliminated. The infected individuals in the room keep violently pounding on the door. Driscoll shows up at the scene just as it seems all hope is lost. Carol is overjoyed to see him, but she withdraws when she learns that he has also contracted the infection. Driscoll frequently claims that the virus has given him more strength and that he now feels energized. In an effort to convince Carol to follow him, he claims that the new society will be free of issues like crime, hate, discrimination, and so forth. Driscoll opens the door and lets all of the other infected people out despite Carol's terrified gunpoint. He then makes the comment that Oliver is hated by the infected people. Everyone tries to capture the young boy as Carol says this, but she shoots and kills them all one by one. She simply shoots Driscoll in the leg when it's her turn, then she and Oliver run away. They break into a police car outside and barely avoid several infected individuals. Dr. Golly no calls Carol while she is driving aimlessly and instructs her to go to a building where a helicopter is waiting to take off. Carol and Oliver arrive at the location after following the instructions, and they are ultimately saved. In the climactic scene, it is revealed that researchers have at long last developed a vaccine against the deadly virus. As a result, the virus has been completely eradicated from the planet, and life has returned to normal. In an interview, Dr. Galindo, who helped develop the vaccine, says that those who receive it won't remember what happened in the past. In the meantime, Carol has adopted Jean and is now dating Driscoll. Driscoll is seen reading a newspaper as the film comes to a close, completely unaware of the bravery he displayed a year earlier as Oliver and Jean leave for school. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the recap. Let us know in the comments what you thought, and while you're here, consider subscribing. We would love to have you as part of our community.